Hi, my name's Dave. So I spent 25 years in federal law enforcement. I started out with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Then I went to the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, and finally 15 years as a special agent with NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration National Marine Fishery Service, U.S. Department of Commerce. That's a mouthful. So 10 years as Uniform Patrol Officer, 15 years as a Special Agent, an 1811 Criminal Investigator. Today, I'm going to share with you tips on how to stay out of trouble, keep your nose clean, and have less stress on the job. Being in law enforcement, you have a gun and a badge, it's already a stressful job. You work long hours. You work weekends, you're on call 24-7, but there's a lot of things I wish someone had sat down with me and said, you know what, Dave, this is what you got to do to get through your career without too many problems. I've made my mistakes, and I've learned a lot, and I'm sharing them with you so you can, right from the start, hopefully if you're beginning, this is a good video for you to watch. How do you stay out of trouble? And the other thing is, this is my First Amendment right, freedom of speech. Also know that what I'm talking about is not, you know, it's my personal opinions, but some of the things I'm talking about, I was never in management. I never wrote policies. So the point is, the policies that I'm talking about were real. And you may say, well, that's a BS policy and we don't have to follow it. No, you have to. you got to follow policies, procedures, rules. Always. And I'm going to explain to you why. And I know when I was especially in a patrol officer, I remember people say, oh, those policies and procedures are meant to get you in trouble. Not so. I learned very quickly that if you follow them to the T, they will protect you. Protection is something really important. Okay, so in federal law enforcement, we're going to start out talking about FLEOLA, the Federal Law Enforcement Officer Association. Okay, I was a member of it. 1811 criminal investigators from all federal agencies, from, you know, National Park Service all the way to the FBI, NOAA. If you're an 1811 criminal investigator, or in certain circumstances, some 1801 law enforcement officers could be members of FLEOLA. You got to do it. There's no excuse not to. Zero excuse not to. We're talking about under $300 a year. It was when I was, in, I, I don't know. I retired in 2016, so it's uh, 2023 now. Happy New Year. Um, but Fleola, it's, it was less than 300 per year. They have top-notch attorneys. And their job is to protect you from being sued, from being arrested, from losing your job. And for $300 a year, it is above and beyond worth it. The next thing is, I believe it's called Fed's Liability. Buy your own liability insurance. It's like 200 a year, I think. Um, and in some agencies will pay you back for whatever you pay into the liability. I believe it's called Fed's Liability. And again, this video is about federal law enforcement. So if you're county, state, local, I, I don't know. Every state, every county, cities are all different. But the federal government, there's... There's some uniformity to how things are done. And, again, what I'm telling you is, Fleola, you've got to be a member. Okay? I'm not getting paid by them to advertise their name. They're amazing. They've helped me out many times. They've helped many people out many times. So, let's start by some really basic concepts. Policies, procedures, rules, agency regulations, whatever they may be called, you must follow them. I kept a big binder with tabs. I highlighted it. I read through it over and over and over. What can I do? What, what am I allowed to do? What am I prohibited from doing within the agency? I kept a copy binder in my vehicle, at my home, and in the office wherever I was, and there was online ones too that I could get on, 
in later years on cell phones. We, we didn't have cell phones when I first started. But the fact is, keep those copies and do like I did. Put tabs on them. Vehicle usage, vehicle accidents, cell phone, computers. What are you allowed to do and what are you not allowed to do? Okay? Travel expenses. Everything. you got to read it. And it's boring. It is the most boring stuff you will ever read. But you got to follow it to the T. No excuses. It's in the book. If you get in trouble, they're going to pull the book out and say, what's on page 62? Okay? So, policies, rules, procedures. Important stuff, highlight it. Have it tabbed so you can flip through it real quickly. Okay? Next thing I would do, too, is and we're going to go into vehicles. First of all, if you're a patrol officer, you may or may not have a take-home vehicle. It depends. BLM, yes. Um, other agencies, no. In your vehicle, and when I was a special agent, I had a take-home vehicle. So in your vehicle, uh, an administrative person in NOAA was very helpful. She made a package of, first of all, like a cheat sheet, step one, two, and three. If you're in an accident, do the following. Who's Who you're going to call, what you need to do, besides, first of all, you make sure the people are okay that were involved. But this is really important. You make a package with all the forms that you have to do, diagrams, everything, fold it up, you put it in like a big manila envelope, put it in your glove box, have another one in the trunk. So if there's an accident, you can pull it out somewhere. Okay, you're, you're, you're nervous, you've been in an accident, but this, you rip it open, step one, okay, I need to call this person, the national office, call the supervisor, contact, this is critical. If your requirement is to contact a local police department for them to do a report, and it probably will be, places like Los Angeles, where I worked for five years, will say, we can't send anyone. Okay, you got to call an administrative number, say, I've been in that, but there's no injuries. They said, we don't care. We're not going to send someone. And so as a federal agent, you got to like beg them, please, I have to, by you know, law, by federal law, I have to get a police report. Will you send someone? And they might say, okay, we'll send somebody in two to three hours. Just stay put. It sucks, but you got to do it. Because if you don't, and you tell your boss, well, I'm not going to stay on the side of a highway in L.A. for three, four hours. They're going to say, why not? That's what policy says. Remember page uh, 44. You must have a local police report. Okay? This stuff is so annoying, these, these procedures and policies, but they will protect you. And that's important. When you talk about government vehicles, the vehicle belongs to the federal government. It's not yours. I had a pickup truck as a special agent. It's mine. I'm responsible for the tires, for the maintenance, if it gets broken into. Everything about that vehicle and what's inside it is my responsibility. And policies and procedures and rules dictate what can I do with that vehicle and what can I do, okay? And some people, some agents just never got it. True story, there's an agent that I know. He's got little kids. They miss the school bus. The school's only four blocks away, four or five blocks away, less than a quarter mile to go to work. He's got to drive by the school. He says to the kids, yeah, get in the back and I'll take you to school. Drives up. And maybe he's done this before. He stops. They jump out. And he goes down the road to the next stop sign until the deputy special agent charge and assistant special agent charge basically cut him off. They get out of the car. The ASAC says to him, get in with the DSAC. I'm taking your vehicle. ASAC drives off with his truck. He's like, the DSAC says, get in. I'm going to take you home. Don't come to work for one month. One month, no pay. You do it again, you're fired. And he goes, here's a letter. Somebody might have ratted him out and said, yeah, I see him taking his kids to school. Now, most of us, most of us would say, that's petty. It's no big deal. It is a big deal. Policy says don't do it. Nobody gets in that vehicle unless they're authorized by your direct supervisor, 
or they're an agent with another agency, or you've made an arrest, but it's work-related. Nobody else can, all right? Government doesn't want to be liable if you're in a wreck and the kids get hurt. But they're like, hey, we didn't authorize this. That's their reasoning. Whether you like it or not, it's not your vehicle. Don't do it. On the way home from work, don't pull off and see your kids at a soccer game. No. You go from your home to the office or your home to an investigative site or to a meeting. You don't deviate from the rules, the policies, the procedures ever. Okay? One month without pay sucks. I couldn't have done it back then. I mean, that's harsh. That's pretty hardcore. Second time, getting fired. Again, I had a supervisor. I had several supervisors over the course of my 25-year career. But a supervisor had a take-home vehicle. But he was on light duty. It was a medical issue. When you're on light duty, you can't take home the G-Ride, your government vehicle. If you can't perform law enforcement duties, and you're on light duty, you don't get to take home a law enforcement vehicle because you can't respond to emergency calls. But the supervisor kept driving, commuting from his home to the office because he's not, you don't pay for the gas. It's a free commute, right? That's nice. That's a nice thing about having a take home vehicle. You're not paying for the gas for it. He was told, you know, oh, you're light duty. Parked the vehicle. He did. Somebody, but we never found out who, drove by and took some pictures of his vehicle, sent it to the national office and said, this person's on light duty. They were told not to take the vehicle home, but they keep doing it. I'm just letting you know. He got in some trouble there. Okay, somebody had to go to his home, drive the vehicle back to the office, and he said, don't ever do this again. You don't get to take this vehicle home, ever, until you're off light duty. End of story. These vehicles don't, they don't belong to you. It's government property, and it's an enormous responsibility. Know the rules, the regulations, and policies. I was in an accident in Los Angeles. In L.A., it can happen easily. Guess what? Like I said earlier, call the police, LAPD. We don't respond to these things unless there's serious injury or death. Highway Patrol says, don't bother us. We, we don't have the personnel. Call the LAPD again. Please, i got to have this. Yeah, okay, in a couple hours, we'll send someone. Sat there on the side of a road with my vehicle. They came. They did a little report. Guess what? I didn't get in any trouble because the other people had moved their vehicle already. They couldn't do a full investigative report. The fact is, I followed policy. Called the boss, called the national office. Next day, I came to work. I did the computer form that I needed to do for accidents. Sent it out within, you know, 48 hours. Did everything I was supposed to. Didn't get in trouble. I followed policy. You know, we had another agent who was a minor vendor vendor. Says, I'm not going to wait three hours for LAPD to show up. He left. Well, he had issues. He didn't follow policy. It's annoying, but you got to do it. Other things, okay? Your cell phones, okay? So you, this is my personal one, but you will get a government cell phone with internet and everything else. How cool is that? Okay? If you're a federal agent, you're going to get one of these. They belong to the government. Everything that you put in there is government. Okay? Don't put stupid stuff in there. Don't tell jokes. Don't, you know, say to yourself, is there anything in here I wouldn't want the boss or management to see? If the answer is yes, then you're violating policy. Follow policy. Okay? And if they say, we want you to put a big cover on it that's, that won't fit in your pocket, guess what? You say, okay, yes. If you lose it, if you break it, it's your responsibility. The government owns this. They're lending it to you to use for your job. It's theirs. They can take it at any time. They can walk in your office. They give me your phone. You have to give it to them. Same thing with computers, laptops. 
I've got a few things to talk about on laptops. It's really important. Okay. Understand, at any time, they can walk into your office at any time. Two in the morning when you're not there, they can take your laptop and walk away with it. Leave a little note. The DSAC has your laptop. Well, right? If there's nothing in there that you've done that's that's not inappropriate, you got nothing to worry about. I had that happen. Interesting circumstance. I had to go to Saipan, a U.S. territory, two hours from Guam. It's over near the Philippines. The other side of the world. I had to take my laptop. I was required. They sent an email. You need to take your laptop. I said, well, my air card. I sent to the technician, the computer technician, well, my air card, back in the day, there wasn't Wi-Fi, so you had a little box with an antenna that could get satellites. Will my air card work in Saipan, and will it be okay to use? It's not going to incur any extra cost. Oh, you're good to go. That's a U.S. territory. The DSAC, Deputy Special Agent in Charge, says, you need to send your weekly reports, your timesheets, everything that you normally have to do, review some case reports, and I want you to take lots of pictures of what's going on over there and send them to me. Okay. I go there. Turns out I stayed for a month because of a typhoon, and it was kind of insane. I had to babysit a Taiwanese fishing vessel. But I get back. And like a week later, maybe two, a supervisor that's four hours away shows up in my office and says, give me your laptop now. Okay, may I ask why? No, give me your laptop. Okay, here you go. And then he hands me a letter and says, you owe $10,000. You incurred cost on that computer while you were inside. But $10,000, ouch, that's painful. He said, I did everything I was supposed to. No, you got to pay. Guess what? I call Fleola. And I tell him, I didn't look at anything inappropriate. I don't care what they look at. There's nothing there. I did everything I was told to. Here are the emails. Always keep your emails. Make hard copies of controversial or emails. You go on travel and they say, yeah, bring this, this, this. You keep those emails, hard copies in files, and you take it home. You keep those files in a file cabinet at home. That's what I did. Okay? I contact Leola. They go through the files. Oh, you were told to bring it. You were told to send pictures. You were told that the air card was good. You were told that you could use it for personal go on Facebook and send emails and you were allowed to do all this because you were gone for 30 plus days, okay? And you're surviving in a typhoon. So you were told, go ahead. And it's in writing. Well, Fleola contacts the agency and says, he's not going to pay a dime. It's illegal what you're doing. He did everything he did in accordance to policy and procedures on computers. One, you never share those manuals. Now, Fleola, you can say, this is what the policy says, but I can't give them the policy because that's written in the policy not to ever give it to anyone. But I can say, I can read off to them, this is what it says. Keep that in mind. You have, always read the small print. So anyway, Fleol calls the agency and says he's not going to pay a dime. And um, what we'll do is, if you continue to force this, then we will file a lawsuit against you for $10,000 plus attorney fees. Okay, because this is an appropriate violation of his rights. And guess what? Several days after they sent their notification to the agency, my supervisor shows up and says, here's your old computer back. Okay, thanks. Uh, oh, here's an official warning letter saying, don't do it again. Well, they got to save face with the national office. So they got to tell the national office, well, we, we warned them. It's under control now. That'll never happen again. But that's how the government operates. You can never, no matter what agency you're in, you can never trust the government. And that's why you're a member of FLEOLA. That's why you have liability insurance. That's why I had three different copies of the policies, the rules, and the procedures. And again, government owns the cell phone, the company truck, you know, the laptop computer that you use at work, these don't belong to you. Do not look at stuff you're not supposed to. Don't look at porn. Don't send jokes, inappropriate things. It's work-related only. Because at any time, someone can say, give it to me. They can open it up, 
they have programs, they have a computer technician, and they have law enforcement agents that are specialists in computer, searching computer files, and they can go through every file that's ever been on there, and they can look for things, certain topics, certain words, you know, and they'll go right through it. You can't hide stuff on there from them. I didn't get in trouble because I had nothing in my computer that was inappropriate. Okay? But you can't trust the government to protect you, so you have FLEOLA and liability insurance to follow your procedures. Okay? And you never forget the government owns this property. It was also interesting, on that trip to Saipan, other people had letters like mine. You used too many hours on your computer, you called too many calls on the government cell phone. And again, they went to Flea Hole too. The Flea Hole was pretty fired up about it. And they're like, these guys are there for 30, 30 plus days on the other side of the planet away from their families. And you're getting mad because they were calling their wives, talking two or three minutes over when they were supposed to. Okay, you guys are so petty. Yeah, it's not going to happen. You got to be careful. Again, become a member of FLEOLA Liability Insurance. The other thing is the people you work with, the other agents or other patrol officers, are not your friends. They are your co-workers. You can't trust them. At some point in time, somebody you're close to would do something that not only will hurt your feelings because you've been friends with them or went through training with them, but it'll screw you over big time. You know, somebody, you've been to their home, you've met their family, you've had Thanksgiving dinner with them, you know, you go hunting or fishing with them. Guess what? Somewhere along the line, you're sitting there having a few beers, and you say, boy, the boss, just stupid. He's incompetent, he's this and that. All of a sudden, you find out that that person you trusted so much went to the boss and told him this. Why? Because the people you work with at some point will want a job that you have, a bonus, a special detail. They want something, or, or if you're putting in for a transfer, they want it. Somebody out there will want something that you have or are going to get, and they'll do everything they can to stop it so that they can get it. You will always be in competition with all the people there, maybe for a supervisor role or a temporary supervisor, new vehicle, whatever it may be, somebody that you're close to will want something. And that's why you're polite, you're nice, you don't ever talk about your personal life. If you have marital problems or you're getting married, you're engaged, you're moving in with someone, or you know, you have a kid that gets getting in trouble at school, whatever it may be, you never tell people about this. Keep your personal life close to you. Nobody needs to know. And I can't tell you how many times I've had supervisors say, so are, 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 I thought I heard a rumor. Are you getting married? I said, well, you know, I'm thinking about it. And I just cut it off. I'm not sure. I'll think about it. Because they will find a way to use that against you. They like knowing information. If you're on social media, don't tell your boss. Don't ever let them, hey, can I be your friend? No. I personally used to use a different name, a nickname. I didn't put my last name. I put a nickname so that people didn't know who it was. I didn't put my post my picture. I was very careful about who I would let on my Facebook as friends. Very careful about what I would say. It's anything that could be construed as being political, impolitically correct or not woke, as they would say now, can be used against you. You always have to think, if I type something, if I say something, if I, whatever, can I get in trouble for it? Is this inappropriate? Would it bother me if everybody on the planet Earth found out I, I said this? Same thing at work. Your emails, like I, I've said it a million times, I'll say it again. Don't put jokes on there. Don't put anything inappropriate. Keep it professional only. As little as possible. And another thing, with your personal... I've made this mistake, okay? It didn't come back to bite me, but it could have. I had, you know, my government 
cell phone. I actually kept it in a container, all my hips, strapped in good. But my personal cell phone had much better cameras. So there was a time when I went out to a case, investigative site, and I used my personal camera, because personal cell phone, because I had a better camera. And then just would send that to email over to my government email. Horrible. It didn't come back to bite me, but it could have. Don't ever, ever do that. Don't use it for pictures, recordings, anything. Your personal cell phone, okay, it's not for work. Now, the reason is, had that gone to a criminal trial, I think it was a civil investigation I did, had that gone to a criminal trial, the defense attorney could have looked at all my emails, said, wait a second, what's this video of case file, this? Where's that email coming from? Okay. With discovery, they get all the information. And you say, well, you know, I used my uh, personal cell phone at home to take pictures. Well, we'll need your personal cell phone to review it. Do you want a suspect's attorney having your cell phone in their possession, being able to search every file, every picture, everything you've ever put into this, that you've sent to your friends, loved ones, everything? A suspect in a case, their attorney getting all this. No, then you don't use your personal cell phone ever for investigative purposes. You don't do it. Okay? You don't ever, ever do it because they can take it and use it. You never talk bad about your boss or management. It will come back to bite you. Okay? Um, you know, somebody I went through training at Flesley, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Georgia. Somebody that, you know, I'm we were close friends. We talked all the time. He'd call me, hey, can you help me with this case? You have a lot of experience in this or that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is what you do. I mean, we were, we were pretty close. When we switched, he left the agency. And when we switched, the regions changed. We became one big Pacific Coast region, West Coast region. It was a new, you know, new SAC, special agent in charge. I didn't like him, but he was a jerk. And I told him, yeah, he's a new sack we have. And he's kind of a jerk, arrogant, and just, I don't know what his deal is. But turns out, my friend was friends with him. And my friend was trying to get back to the agency. What a better way than to rat someone out, to show your loyalty. And that's what my so-called friend did. Wow, it hurts. This is somebody I knew for over a decade. If they were willing to go to that extreme to get back in the agency and get their old job back. People will do that to you. People that you trust. I had another thing where you know, I was writing up a grievance. And I'm going to talk about that too, real quickly. But I wrote up a letter saying you know, I was going to file a grievance on, on a supervisor. And uh, somebody that I was friends with, another agent, we would talk all the time. I've met his family. I've been to his home. I said, what? I said, can you look at this? I said, don't show it to anyone, but can you look at this? Do you think that you, because he had filed a grievance on his supervisor. I said, is this kind of like how you did yours? I'm just asking you to look at it. Again, just destroy it. Don't send it in. Um, he sent it to someone. Not only just to someone, but someone back east that had been investigated by the agency and my agency was in turmoil, and, you know, the a whole entire agency was under investigation for being, you know, overreaching with the industry and this and that. This was a bad person. Got that grievance letter and then used it as a complaint in Congress, and it all came back to me as, why does this person have it? I don't know. I had no clue, and I didn't. For almost a year, I didn't have a clue. And the agent, my agency was coming down hard. You know, you're lying. I said, I got Fleola. Fleola said, no. He doesn't know. You have no proof that he gave that. I said, and then it dawned on me. I let somebody look at it. And somebody from Fleola connected with them, called the, the bad guy that had the letter. And the bad guy was kind of like, yeah, I don't know this guy. Somebody sent me this 
believe in slaughter. I don't know who sent it to me, but I can tell you, I've never heard of this person. I don't know Dave. I've never talked to him. I've never had anything. So, yeah, if he's in trouble, he shouldn't be. Somebody who says they knew him sent that. Okay, this is somebody I trusted, a special agent that I've worked with, have partners, went through training, knew the family. Why? Because they hated management and they wanted to get them. And they used my draft graph, uh, um, grievance letter as a way to stir things up. Somebody always wants something from you. Be careful. Don't ever. I made a mistake. I didn't get in trouble, but it was embarrassing. Okay? Just like I when I worked in L.A., there were multiple agents that said, you know, I had agents come up to me, we don't like the way your supervisor, the ASAC, treats you. It really upsets us. We think you should file a grievance against him. We should think you go in his office and tell him how you feel. It's wrong what he's doing. You need to go in there and stand up for yourself. They hated that boss. But they wanted me to do that. And I said, no. If it upsets you, you're welcome to do it on, on my behalf. That's okay. But I'm not going to do it. Well, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with me is... It's my business, not yours. Okay? There are people that will try to talk you into doing things that you shouldn't do. Don't fall for it. A young agent I know, she she did that. The same group of people told her, you tell him how you feel. And she stood up and said, you know what? We're tired of this and this and that. And we, and all of a sudden she looked and the people that told her to do that, they're stepping back and they're, I don't, I don't remember saying that, you know. She looked like an idiot. They stepped back and she stepped forward. This is how it works in the federal government. People are weasels. Don't, don't listen to people. Okay? Don't jump in on the cause. Um, so the next thing is, I don't want to be too long on this, never, never ever file a grievance against a supervisor or management. It's a screwed up system. And um, it's complicated. I'll try to be quick. You have two different groups in some agencies. EEO, Employment Equal Opportunity, and then the Equal Rights Division. Okay? I witnessed a senior level agent sexually harass a younger female uh, officer. I witnessed it. And then I, I gave testimony, and things came down on me for doing that. And so I filed a grievance. EEO and the Equal Rights said, we're on board with you. We got your back. This can't be allowed. It's illegal. Follow our directions, and we'll get you through this. Okay? Okay. I trust you. Okay? And as time went on, I did all the paperwork, wrote down documentation as to what happened, and almost a year later, almost a year later, all of a sudden they said, okay, great. You'll be ready for the next step, the, the, the trial date. I go, what do you mean? Oh, and we can't help you anymore. I go, what the hell? Yeah, we got to be neutral, okay? We can't take sides in this. Uh, the grievance process is actually a lawsuit, you versus the United States government. And it turns out that there's, I was up against 10 attorneys from the federal government. And I was like, EEO and Equal Rights said, mm, we can't help you anymore. You're on your own. We suggest you get a good attorney. Fleola really couldn't help because my job wasn't in danger. See, they protect your job. They protect you from lawsuits. But if you be, are the aggressor going after the government, they don't help you. And regular attorneys are super expensive. Okay. You see how this is a bad deal. When you file a grievance, your boss will never get in trouble for any horrible things that he did. Ever. What it means is you are filing a lawsuit against the agency. And when I remember when the agency, they had private investigators investigating me, talking to my neighbors. I'm like, no, no, this, this isn't right. Oh, it is. 
I'm filing a lawsuit against them. They have to defend themselves. This is what the grievance process is. Never trust EEO or equal rights in your agency. And then the agency will say, how much do you want? They'll meet with you. If you stick it out for like two years plus, and it comes really close to the trial date, then the agency, they don't want to go to trial. And I say, well, take action against the supervisor. Punish him for what he did. Discipline him. They said, no, that's not going to happen. How much do you want? I don't want any money. I want my valuation changed. I want the supervisor disciplined. He did something illegal. How much money do you want? See, that's how it works. And what happens is, because I knew other people, and it, you have to be signed a confidential disclosure. You'll never talk about it. People do talk about it. What happens is, is that other people that I knew in the agency that went through this, they, let's say, I'm just making up a number. They said, I want $100,000. And in some cases, the agency will say, okay, but you're going to sign here saying that you're going to quit your job and you will never apply to a federal position ever again. And we'll give you 100000 and you go away, and you can never tell anyone what the terms and conditions of this was. That's what happens with a grievance. And I didn't want to give up my job because I had still six or seven years so I could retire. You know, I'm not going to give up my job. I've got too much invested. So I took a transfer to another location, Los Angeles. And that's what you got to do. Never file a grievance against a supervisor because your grievances are a lawsuit in the federal government. They will never discipline management, okay? So, you either put in for another job, and what I suggest is if, you want, if you're putting in for another job, let them know. I'm putting in for another agency, okay? But I need a good recommendation to get out of here. Otherwise, I'd be forced to, you know, file a grievance. And guess what the agency will say? We'll give you a good recommendation. We'll give you the best. They want you gone. And they will. Always. Yep. Awesome employee. Get them out of the, there. Right? Or you say, I'm going to take a transfer to another duty station within the agency. And they may say, okay. You know, here's a duty station nobody wants. You can go there. It sucks. Yeah, it sucked. I, I had a beautiful spot. When I was with Noah from basically, you know, Queen Arena, Mendocino, all the way up to Brookings, Oregon. Wow, gorgeous. And now I'm being stuck in L.A. for my last five years of the job. But you know what? I met my wife. I got a huge raise, cost of living increase. It worked out in the end. But you never file a grievance against a supervisor because a grievance, keep that in mind, please, believe me, a grievance is you are filing a lawsuit against the federal government and you're the aggressor and you're up against 10 very good attorneys that get paid, you know, $200,000 a year. You're up against them. And the only thing you can get is maybe some money. You know? We had some people, employees... They got some money, but you know what? You think about it. You're giving up your job, your pension. You're giving up your health insurance. It's not worth it. But they did it. They said, okay, I'll take, you know, 100000 200000 and I'll walk out the door. In the workplace, no jokes. Don't talk inappropriately in front of women. If there's transgenders, you don't mention anything about the way they look. I mean... Hey, if there's some dude with a mustache and a beard and wears a dress and lipstick and earrings, you know what? You call them by the name they want to be called, you smile, and you be nice to them. Professionalism. And I don't care whether you like that or not. That'll keep you out of trouble. Okay? I'm at almost 40 minutes. Look, federal law enforcement is tough, no matter what agency you're with. Okay? But you got to follow these... These procedures, policies. One other thing, too. I know there's, there's things popping in my head. I'm telling you true stories that have happened. I knew an agent way up there in the Pacific Northwest somewhere. 
And he told me the story. He comes home from work. It's Super Bowl night. Because he was working on Sunday or so. Whatever the Super Bowl is, he was working that day and night. On his way home, his friends had invited him to a party. So he stops by on the way home. That's wrong. Okay, so that's the first no-no. You're in a government vehicle. You go from what? Remember, home to the workplace or out in the field and back. He stops at home at a party place. And then he starts drinking. And he's got his gun on. Okay? And then he gets into a fight over the teams and says, you know, so-so, you're stupid, and your team's dumb, and it, it's ridiculous. But somebody there knew who he was and that he was armed, and they filed a complaint. He got into a whole lot of trouble. One, misuse of government vehicle. Two, you're drinking while you've got a gun on. Somebody's complaining that they felt unsafe because you raised your voice and you were calling people names. You're getting drunk. He got into a whole lot of trouble. Somehow he kept his job. Okay? But he got into a whole lot of trouble. You don't do that. You don't drink while having a gun on. And your gun, when you go, this is really important, when you go to, let's say, a hotel and you're going to go out with during in-service and you're going to go out with some friends and have some beers and go drinking, party for the night, which I don't advise, what is the way your gun is locked up? You flew there, okay? So you don't have a safe with you. I used to have this lock that would go, I carried a clock, it went through the handle, you take the magazine out through the handle, through the slide, and you can do it around like, piping on the toilet in the back or the sink okay so if someone tried to grab it they would have to cut the pipes and everything else off or if, now if there's a little safe there you can put it in there the same thing you still want to have that lock around it because you keep the key nobody can ever use it okay you got to think about that that gun has to be secure in a secure place your laptop computer cannot be in checked baggage no, you're carrying that on the plane with you. Computers get stolen all the time out of check baggage. And a laptop computer with case reports and with your supervisor, your new supervisor lost the computer, someone stole it. Guess what? It had all their timesheets, their social security numbers, but personal identifier information, PII information. The federal government loves its, its acronyms. Guess what? Computer stays with you. And if you go and you're in a hotel room, lock it up. There's locks that you can, they're chintzy, but you lock it up according to policy. And the most important advice, a lot of people don't like to hear this, in your career, the most important thing isn't your case files, your case reports, how many cases you win, or how many arrests you make, how many tickets you write. It's your administrative work. It has to be precise. It has to be 100%. Um, your fuel logs do everything according to policy. You know, My agent said you had to have your receipts. In the morning you do your fuel log. I start at this mileage. Okay. Then during the day I got gas at this mileage. Here's the receipt. I put this many. So I had a little diary. I had a notebook. And I had a plastic thing three with a three ring binder. Three holes in it. It was like a zip tight. You open it up and I'd stick my receipts in it. Okay. I was very careful because that's what I was told to do. And I remember once an agent who didn't get the receipt was like, oh, it's no big deal. I only got this much. Okay, but you know what the boss said? Go back to the gas station where you got your fuel and see if you can get the receipt. And the agents yelled at him. That's 80 miles away. I got stuff to do today. I and the boss said, I don't care. You know what the policies are. You need the receipt. It has to be in the PDF file at the end of the week, and it has to be sent to me as part of your paperwork requirement. So see if you can go get it. He had to drive 80 miles with a copy of his receipt. Okay. I was careful. I had my little notebook, put my receipts in, fuel logs were exact. My weekly reports, my timesheets, okay? 
Everything has to be perfect when it comes to administrative. Travel paperwork must be perfect. It has to be. That's more important than anything else. There were people that were slugs in the agency that never made a single arrest, never made any cases, but their administrative work, administrative work looked perfect. And they did well. They got a paycheck. Okay? Your administrative paperwork is the most important thing that comes first over anything else. There's, there's an agency, another agency, and I knew somebody that worked over there. Um, he was a special agent that did his job. He was very quiet. Nobody knew anything about his personal life. He never drank in front of anyone. He wouldn't go out to lunch with people. He was just very quiet, did everything he was supposed to. And he went through his whole career. Nobody really knew anything about him. Never had stress, never had any problems. He was professional, but you never really got to know him. And that's what you want to be. You want to be that guy. You want to be, or, or lady, you want to be the one that nobody knows anything about you. Well, they do a good job. They show up on time, they do everything. You call them and you need help, they're sure, yes, but you don't know anything about them. That's what you strive to be in the federal government. Nobody knows anything about you other than you do a good job and you're professional. That's all that matters. If you don't trust anyone, you have to learn to be guarded. You, you know, it's so easy to call other agents, hey, I'm working on this really cool case. No. Because just like that, all of a sudden they'll weasel themselves in and say, well, you know what, it's tied into my case, so I, I've asked for it to be put up here because it started up here in my area. You don't trust anyone. You don't talk casually with people. Be guarded in your career. It's hard to do because you spend over 10 hours a day with the same people. And you're doing a stakeout somewhere and you're there for five hours from, you know, midnight to five in the morning, desperately trying to stay awake, and you're talking to somebody, and you start talking about life. And that's where you just have to stay guarded and say, and if they ask you, oh, tell me about your family. I'm sorry. I, okay? Nothing personal, but I, I don't talk about personal stuff. Don't be afraid. When you're on details... You know, after hours, you go out with some friends and drink. Well, you never drink and drive. You never drink and drive in the government vehicle. But don't get drunk. I would say don't even drink with other people. I can't tell you how many Christmas parties I never went to. One of the last ones, I was up in the Pacific Northwest, and they said, come on to this big, you know, Christmas party. It's going to be at the d -Sacks home. Great guy. He wants you to be there meet the family. Thank you, but that's okay. I, I'm just not feeling that great. I'm going to just stay at home at, at the hotel. And and that's what I did. I stayed at the hotel. and just I was polite, but I said, no, people said, why aren't you there? This is how you hobnob. This is how you get up the company ladder. I was close to retirement. I was like, no, because you don't drink in front of people. You have to be super guarded. You don't want to talk about your family life, your personal life, your hobbies. You don't want them to know about what's going on in your personal life. You want to be guarded. You want to be the guy that nobody knows anything about. That's going to help you in the end. Okay? Okay. For those of you who say, well, you got to hobnob to get up the company ladder. Well, if that's really your thing, you want to get up there, you got to do what you got to do. But remember, every time you talk about your personal life, it can be used against you. Who you date, who you marry, you know, oh, they're family, and they, somebody in that family got in trouble, right? You know, or, it's just, you don't want that in it. You just want to keep quiet about your personal life. You don't want to trust the people you're working with, because you can't. 
you pray that they'll be good when something bad happens, you know, in a gunfight, God forbid, but you don't talk about your personal life. Okay, this is almost an hour. I can't really go much further. Um, it'd be hard to download my video. But this is, you're brand new, you're starting out. Remember, no matter how bad things get, just put in for another job. Uh, and one, I know I keep saying one last thing. Um, when I worked in Long Beach, something really, really horrible happened upstairs in a different agency. One day I'm looking out my window while typing in board, police cars are coming out with shotguns. I'm like, this is not good. I call 911. This is who I am. I'm armed. I want to get to the basement to get to my G rod so I can get out of the building. Okay? I'm walking through the building with my badge up, my hands up in the air. I'm like, police come rushing out. Federal agent, federal. Okay. I'm going down to get my car. Good. And what had happened was upstairs at the federal building, another agency, I don't, I'm not going to mention their names. It's in the news. It is in the news. Um, a supervisory special agent was getting in trouble with the SAC special agent charge, and another agent was there to oversee what was going on. And the guy pulled a gun and shot his supervisor, and another agent had to shoot and kill him upstairs from me. Federal agent was killed by another federal agent, and another federal agent, and I was downstairs ready to go and they said pull over so the ambulance could pull in and I saw the supervisor come out on the stretcher. This is real. People's <coughs> excuse me. People's tempers can get out of control when you've got a gun. Okay? It's never gotten to that point. And I don't know the whole story. I'm not going to put blame on anyone. I witnessed the supervisor being put in an ambulance there was a dead body upstairs, and there was hundreds of police with shotguns, Long Beach PD, pouring into the building. It was um, an, an intense situation, and you probably should never have got. It should never have gotten to that. If you don't get along with your boss, transfer or move to another agency. Get out of that situation, okay? And you know when things are going south in your job with management, you know that, okay, I pissed some people off. This is not a good situation. I need to get out of it. And you do that as soon as possible. And you apply to hundreds and hundreds of jobs. And as soon as somebody takes it, and it may be something that's even a lower pay grade, to get you out of that situation, it, you can take something else. You can move and go somewhere, anywhere in the country. In the federal system pretty easy okay with any agency in the country you can get out of a bad situation and you may go somewhere where you just don't want to go but you know what you do it what I'm telling you is to keep you out of trouble also do a diary you keep it with you tight you don't tell anybody about it you don't put case information ever in it Keep it vague. Like if you're doing a case and the boss tells you to do something that you really shouldn't do. I was told to do something I feel that was contrary to policy and procedures. This is it. If you don't put the case report, you don't put the names of the person you're investigating. You know, he told me to do this to the suspect or this. And you leave it at that. You keep that diary. Dates, times, you document everything. Nobody knows about it. You carry it with you all day during work. Whenever a supervisor or another agent or management says something that's wrong, inappropriate, you document. On 10 o'clock today, on January 7th, management told me to do this against company policy. I stated policy says no, but they said, no, you must do it anyway. This is who said it. This was what was said. You document it. This is a little notebook that I used to carry in my pocket, take notes. You never tape record anybody in your company. You never do that. People did that and got in trouble. But you can take diary, documentation, okay? If you've got a question, anything, like with me with the computer, and the computer technician said, yeah, yeah, you can use the air card, no problem. You'll be fine. I wrote that down in a book, my diary. And then you keep that 
at home. You never leave it in your office. You never leave it in your company vehicle, government vehicle, okay? Nobody knows about it. Every single day you bring it home with you and you, you put it by your front door so that when you're going out the door in the morning, you pick it up, you take it with you, and you put it in the pocket, and then the boss says, yeah, don't worry about this policy. Just go ahead and do what, you know, whatever you feel is best. And you write that down. Or you and another agent are assigned to go interview someone. And that agent says, I'm tired of this crap. I got, I have a long commute. It's a Friday. I want to see my kid's soccer game. I'm leaving. And you stay an extra four hours waiting for someone and you interview them by yourself. You document that. Because when the boss says, so you and so-so, no, only I interviewed that person. Well, where was so-and-so? I don't know where they went. But, you know, and you don't tell them about that. But you say, I don't know where that other person went, but I stayed. You have to ask that other person where he went during that time. Okay? Oh, all right. You follow directions to your boss, but you write it down. And if the, your partner does something stupid, you document. You document, document, document. Okay? And you leave that diary. You always keep a diary. Date, time, who said what. Who, what, when, where, how, and you keep that with you during the day, but you bring it home at night. And every single day you should have it. And you know what? If you're a federal agent, you're going to at least once a day have something where something questionable happens, and you got to document it. Okay. That's it. Hopefully this helps you out. You know, I wish things were better. That you would have to think about these kind of things. But it's not. If you follow my advice, I can't promise anything in the world. But I think most of the time, you'll stay out of trouble. If you watch this video and share it with other people and say, these are some good ideas. It will make life easier for you. And certainly legally help you stay out of, of getting into trouble. So... Good luck, be safe, and, and please, it, at the very least, listen to what I have to say, and you make your own decisions on what you have to do. So again, be safe out there. Your ultimate goal is to retire with a pension like I did. I retired at age 50, I'm 20 years in, and I hope you can do the same. Good night.